afternoon, everyone, and it's a privilege to welcome David Hare and Peter Ansorge to the Charleston Festival. David Hare is a prolific playwright whose analysis of the nation's institutions has become part of the fabric of political discussion and whose dramas chronicle our biggest public events, such as the Iraq War, Stuff Happens, and the sell-off of the railways, The Permanent Way. And actually, for those of you who are in the previous event, when Ian McEwan lamented that, that there's not enough, not sufficient imaginative literature about the judiciary, um, actually, David was sitting in the audience and his, his uh, drama, Murmuring Judges, um, uh, absolutely fitted the, the bill, which Ian remembered immediately afterwards, of course. <laughs> um, David's 29 plays have enjoyed great success in both Britain and America. He's also famous for his screenplays, for which the most notable for us at Charleston is perhaps the 2002 film version of The Hours, based on Michael Cunningham's novel, which is, of course, partly drawn from Virginia Woolf's life and work. And for those of you who may not realize, Michael Cunningham is going to be with us at the festival next Saturday. Recently, David Hare has been writing for television in the acclaimed spy trilogy, Page 8, Turks and Caicos and Salting the Battlefield, portraying a security service out of control and the disillusioned whistleblower Johnny Warricker. Although David has stated they're primarily entertainments, he's also on record as wondering at the lack of public rage about the abuse of power. Peter Ansorge, former pro producer and commissioning editor of TV drama at the BBC and Channel 4, will talk to David about his career and his forthcoming play at the National, Behind the Beautiful Forevers, due to open in November. So I'm delighted to hand over to David Hare and Peter Ansorge. Good afternoon. Um, I don't know how many of you know that David is actually a local boy from Bex Hill. And the first question I'm going to ask him really is what had that background anything to do with the career he then <laughs> chose to follow? <laughs> David? Uh, well, yeah, I was born in St. Leonard's. Let's get this clear. <laughs> uh, and then I moved at the age of five to Bex Hill. A, bi a big move. Uh, there are two ways. One is really that, um, I, and I don't mean this unkindly, and I don't know Bex Hill well now, uh, but in the 1950s it was a dull town uh, where very little happened. When Marty Wilde came to play, then the Bex Hill Observer was entirely letters against allowing Marty Wilde <laughs> to play at the Delaware Pavilion. Um, and so... It's a classic writer's background. You know, I dreamt of um, getting to London and it stimulated my imagination and the fact that life was so incredibly boring in Bexhill was, I, and I mean it seriously, I don't mean it unkindly. I really do mean that for me, uh, having plays on or writing films or doing any of these things still seems to me incredibly glamorous. I still get a great charge from it because I'm not in Bexhill. <laughs> Can you, you, you have written a recent play about about, about Sussex South yeah, South Downs, South Downs yeah. and was there anything in you of, of that of, of a, a, a kid who was a rebel do you think of me yes um, well I'm distributed I always say the play South Downs is about my education at Lansing College which is a little yeah. down the road in the opposite direction um, and so, really, I wanted to evoke a world that has completely disappeared. In other words, education as it was before it became angled towards consumers and was more coming out of an ethical or religious position uh, with which the pupils had to, you know, had to fall in line. In those days, education was about what they wanted to teach you, not what they wanted to sell you. And so it's a completely different concept of education. And I wanted to write about that. But I'm always incredibly moved. And I actually, um, I have directed Heartbreak House. And I always find the idea that Bernard Shaw was uh, moved to write Heartbreak House by sitting in Virginia Woolf's house and being able to hear the battles of the First World War and the noise of the guns across the channel. In incredibly moving. And in fact, um, 
which is how Heartbreak House ends. That's how jo Heartbreak explosion. House ends. And John Christie, in fact, who founded Glyndebourne, same thing. He came back from battle in 1916. He was invalided out of the First World War. And then he would sit in the garden at Glyndebourne. And from the garden in Glyndebourne, he could hear his comrades in the... He could hear the noise of the war he'd just been invalided out of. And I find the proximity of Sussex to the continent in that way incredibly powerful. And I'm, I'm sure it has marked me in my attitudes. I'm absolutely bewildered by anti-Europeanism. And I'm sure that's by... I just emotionally don't understand it. And so because, I'm sure that's partly to do with being born in Sussex. So that notion of England, this garden of Sussex, contrasted with something else and wider, in this instance, the war and the aftermath, that's been part of your work, hasn't it? Well, I, I, I then got very interested in the difference, you know, and I'm, I'm a sucker for all the mystic, uh, you know, Canterbury Tale, the Powell and Pressburger film, uh, which is about mystic England and this sense of these young men going and flying across the channel and um, dying in uh, battles in Europe, which mean a huge amount to the British. They are part of, um, the, you know, what were we fighting in Europe for if, if we aren't part of Europe? So it just... Um, it's all this idea of people going to die in Europe has always had an incredibly strong charge for me, partly because, of course, that's the circumstances in which I grew up. Everyone was in a trauma about an event which I had missed. So anyone who's my age, and I guess there are a lot of people in the audience who are my <laughs> age, will remember that we had missed the main event. It had just happened, and everyone was behaving in a very peculiar way. And in Beck's Hill, the words nice and quiet were synonymous. In other words, people said, I love Beck's Hill, it's nice and quiet. It's, it's impossible to imagine anything being nice that wasn't quiet. And of course, everybody wanted quiet because they'd lived through a terrible trauma of which in those days they did not speak, except through propaganda films, obviously, which were all produced at Shepperton and Pinewood. Um, but they didn't speak openly about the, the war, and obviously the idea of post-traumatic stress was not something much discussed in the 1950s. And so everything in my childhood is explained by an event which I missed. Just moving on a bit, the other connection with this place, Charleston knew, uh, just going around the house and remembering the Bloomsbury group, is, uh, had a strong connection with Cambridge, where you then went. <laughs> Um, and uh, it's, it, 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 I wonder, because they regarded Cambridge as a place where it could be a base for dissent, particularly, I suppose, at King's College. Um, did you enjoy Cambridge? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd had a wonderful education at Lansing College, and I had a sort of university education at Lansing College. Uh, the standard of the teaching, in retrospect, is just dazzlingly high. And like a lot of people, I had a couple of great teachers um, yes. who introduced me to literature, Harry Guest, who was a famous teacher at Lansing, and Donald Bancroft. And both of these teachers taught in a way that was generous and open, and they would just say, here's something you should read, and give you something that might interest you, and then they were willing to talk to you about it in their time or out of their time. And so that was university education. By the time I went to Cambridge, it was the very opposite. In other words, it was a university run by critics. And so critics tend to be list makers. And so, you know, the business of studying English literature at Cambridge was just the business of making lists. And Levis, F.R. Levis, a now forgotten or near forgotten figure who once <laughs> loomed so large in British intellectual Absolutely. life. Uh, but Levis, by and large, had made a list of uh, approved writers who it was okay to study and the list was amazingly short. Uh, I think it was five, wasn't what? it five? There were sort of five, I mean <laughs> Dickens only gets on for one novel yeah. and I can't remember which Hard one. Times I think. Is it hard? Yeah. I, I, I think it's less obvious than that. You know. I, think, I think it's somebody really, because uh, these people were really difficult critics, you know, they were critics Literature was constantly letting them down. It yeah. wasn't good enough. <laughs> and they felt a sense of intense personal disillusionment yes. with everybody except Shakespeare, yeah. Dunn. And D.H. Lawrence, curiously. D.H. Lawrence, 
Milton, <laughs> he went in and out. Yeah. But he's, he sometimes was admitted to have been quite good, but at other times not. And so, you know, it was a, it was a faculty run for critics, for trainee critics. Yes. And there's a wonderful saying of Ted Hughes's, which I only discovered um, a couple of years ago, but it's the most beautiful thing he said, where he said, you can get out of Cambridge a creative writer, but only by keeping an eye on the watchtowers and crawling out under the wire. So. <laughs> Actually, that could be literally true because they'd close the college doors at midnight <laughs> and the only way to get back in was to climb over and every few years somebody died. Yeah, yeah? it's true. Now, the other thing about the English faculty is that they didn't take the theatre seriously. Oh, no. And yet, paradoxically, some of our greatest theatre talents read English at Cambridge and spent most of their time directing theatre. It has no drama department, still doesn't. That's what you did? Uh, yes. I mean, my, my um, direct... The, the reason I went to Cambridge was to study with Raymond Williams, who, interestingly, is a figure who is now more remembered than Levis. And actually, in terms of Google hits, there are two million Google hits on Raymond's name which is more than the rest of the new left combined. And it's quite extraordinary that Raymond is, has become this figure who, yeah. is, who now seems incredibly important. But having said that, he did nevertheless decide that it was necessary to teach a course called Modern Tragedy, in which he wanted to get everybody to study plays. And he himself had last been to the theater in 1953. <laughs> And it, it just <laughs> the study of drama, it did not occur to anybody teaching drama that the study of drama might be illuminated by a visit to the theatre. <laughs> this is absolutely true. This is absolutely true. I mean, I first met David at Cambridge, and what, how, why we first got on, I think, wasn't actually our ideas about drama or anything. It was precisely that. We, we were very perplexed by the teaching and the direction it was taking and the lack, lack of interest, particularly in theatre, which was, which was quite lively in those days. Yeah, there's an extraordinary quote of Levis's. Um, when Levis was told that Wittgenstein had been seen outside a cinema queuing to go to a film, uh, then Levis said, well, no doubt, after all that day's heavy mental activity, he needs something mindless in the evening. <laughs> and... <laughs> It would be very hard to explain to Levis that actually the films that I was seeing, by Godard, by Louis Malle, by Truffaut, by Bergman, by Joe Losey, were infinitely more stimulating to me. <laughs> Absolutely. And stimulating to my imagination, and actually were at a higher level of artistic achievement than anything that was going on at the time. You know, if you set Ingmar Bergman beside, say, William Golding, I would say that, you know, the cinema as an art form was in a state of vitality much more than the, the British novel was at, at, in the 50s and 60s. I, I totally agree. I mean, it was... Now, at the end, after Cambridge, you obviously decided on a, on, to go into theatre. Uh, but unlike the s slight generation before you, Peter Hall and Trevor Nunn, you didn't go into rep or anything that resembled conventional theatre. It was the birth of what we call, in the late 60s, fringe theatre, is that right? Yeah. Was that a deliberate choice, or was it accidental? No, we all wanted, everybody I knew wanted to work in the cinema, but at the time there was no British cinema, or the British cinema was very stale and mainstream. At the end of the 60s, uh, there was very little opportunity for anything that would have resembled continental filmmaking at the time. So we were more or less thought forced to go into the theatre if you wanted to be involved in the performing arts. Uh, but we went, we, Tony Bicar and I formed a company and called... And Tony Port was another Cambridge... Yeah, and we formed a company called Portable Theatre. And the aim was simply to have nothing to do with the mainstream theatre of the day, but to go to all the places where theatre didn't usually go. So we'd go to prisons, we'd go to village halls, we'd go to army camps, we'd perform in people's rooms, and we'd take um, short, sharp, violent plays, mostly unpleasant, mostly um, <laughs> very roughly performed, uh, with the aim of shocking and upsetting people um, 
in the, in the hope that they would realize how deep the crisis in capitalism was at the time. That you, was the aim of the company. You did, you did. And we brought the system down, as you all see. <laughs> but you did actually shock a few people. We did shock people. It, no. was, it was very, very shocking. Our favorite performance of all time was uh, we gave a performance in Workington, in the, uh, something which you find hard to believe, but it was called the Carnegie Hall in Workington. Uh, <laughs> And we were informed that the audience was still sitting there stunned by the time we'd left the city limits. <laughs> <laughs> and there simply had been no curtain call because there wasn't anyone in the audience who wanted to applaud anything that we'd done. But, 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 but on the other hand, they were very, very <laughs> reluctant to leave because they couldn't quite believe what they'd just seen. <laughs> and in fact, you part of Portable originally as a director, not a writer, is that right? Or was yeah, that as a director. And you stumbled upon writing, was it accidentally? No, what happened was that we had um, um, a promise of a... Our writers were rather... I mean, it's nearer to punk, really. I mean, as theatre, it's nearer... If you imagine what music was to punk, we were to theatre. So, well, I will just say one thing, that Tony Beecar founded this group. The three, the three writers he brought on were David, Snoo Wilson, and Howard Brenton, which is yeah. quite a... And Tony found us all. You know, Tony was the producer who spotted the potential in all of us, and he spotted the potential in this student at East Anglia University called Snoo Wilson. And Snoo said, I'll write you a play, but I've got to do my exam first. And he kept saying, the play's coming, but I've got to finish my course at East Anglia. And uh, it was op at a certain point, it was clear that he was not going to deliver the play. And so, because Snoo failed to deliver on a Wednesday, I had to write something to begin <laughs> rehearsal the following Monday. And we were performing. So I simply wrote a play with the typewriter on my knee in the van. <laughs> And we travelled round from date to date, and I would write, and then I'd read bits out in the van to the actors and say, how does this sound? And they say, yeah, that sounds all right. And when I gave them the play to rehearse on Monday morning, although the play was absolutely terrible, as you would expect, nevertheless, the actors looked at a page of dialogue and went, yeah, we can say that. They, they, there was a sort of, oh, OK, he can write dialogue. And that's really all an actor needs, is the sense of, uh, this is actually sayable. And so, that's where it started, by default. And the next kind of phase is you, 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 you left the fringe, in a way, or not, or not entirely. <laughs> I had and arguments with the fringe, yeah. And what was... The basis of the argument, really, was that this was a massively... I think there's a statistic about... Between 1968 and 1987, 800 theatre groups were founded in this country. So this is not entirely an artistic phenomenon. This is a social phenomenon. And plainly, theatre doesn't have music's power or prevalence, which is obviously far more than 800 rock groups were founded in that period. But there's something about the anger of the generation which is particularly well suited to theatre groups and which can, a sort of paradoxical energy that comes out of anger, which found its expression through all these theatre groups. And when they started, they were entirely spontaneous. Gus, who was the administrator, is somewhere in the audience today, and Gus will testify that we simply flew by the seat of our pants, and we were just making it up as we went along. And... Um, then, within a few years, an alternative circuit had grown up. Suddenly, where we had once gone to canteen floors, there were now arts centres. And the very aesthetic judgments we'd been trying to avoid, in other words, we were trying to avoid that kind of, I loved his Hamlet, but I didn't like his kind of theatre going. <laughs> you know, now they were saying to us, Pip Simmons was great last week, but you're not as good as the freehold next week. And the same aesthetic judgments were being made. So this hope of somehow being able to do theatre free of aesthetics became impossible. And all you had was two circuits, a circuit of 600, 700, 800 seat theatres and a circuit of small theatres. And I didn't see any point anymore 
in being in the small theatres out of political choice. So when the National Theatre was built, a tremendous argument happened in the, in the 70s about whether it would be bad form to join the National Theatre. The National Theatre had been the progressive dream of everybody since Granville Barker and Bernard Shaw. Every progressive in this country had wanted to free theatre from commercial pressure and to create a, an art theatre which was indestructible, that was strong enough to be indestructible through subsidy. And that had been a progressive dream. But when it happened in the 1970s, the politics flipped. And suddenly, you had a group of left-wing people saying, no, the National Theatre is going to be an establishment theatre. Yeah. No left-wing person should have anything to do with it. And, and I so I was in a position, Howard Brenton was in a position, where we were arguing, yeah, it's going to be an establishment theatre if you allow everybody else who doesn't believe in a national theatre to run it. But those of us who do believe in a national theatre, there's no censorship. Peter Hall doesn't intend to stop us saying exactly what we want to. So why should we not have control of the most um, eloquent and largest stage that we can get our hands on? But it was a bitter and divisive yeah. argument in which Howard and I were basically accused of being traitors. And joining the establishment. And joining the establishment. As sometimes exactly. you are today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, your choice of subject matter is what we're going to go on to next. In that, from the beginning, um, you took the decision to write in an epic way. I mean, not in every play, but we're thinking of plenty and, and, and then, then the other plays you did at the National about English institutions. I mean, you've, you've done, you have done the law, <laughs> you've done the Church of England, you've done the Foreign Service. Um, you've, you, 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 this is a deliberate thing on your part. It was a political thing. Yeah. It so seemed... you said, I want to do this. No, it's not <coughs> I want to do it, because you don't know in what way your artistic I mean, I have to explain, as a political writer, you are as much at the mercy of your imagination as any other kind of writer. Yeah. You know, you don't sit down and say, oh, I've really got to write a play about such and such, it's politically important. Or if you do, it won't be a very good play. Your imagination feeds you, and you are as helpless in front of your imagination as anybody else. But I could see that I was not keen on plays in rooms. Yeah. And the reason I wasn't keen on plays in rooms is because they very rarely have a sense of history in them. I know Chekhov's central claim is that you can tell that the revolution's coming by putting 10 people in a room. If you're Chekhov, you can. But very few people can do that. And very few people are at that level of genius where you really say, this has to crack and the Russian revolution has to come soon. Or we can feel that pe the peasants will soon have to be freed. You know, if you're Chekhov, yes. But the other tradition, which is the Shakespeare tradition, which is if you have a battle you put the battle on the stage. If, you have, uh, if, if, if people make love, they make love on stage. If they murder each other, they murder each other on stage. Shakespeare shows the event. Chekhov implies the event. And I think Shakespeare's my man. And I think through that, you get a sense of history because he actually puts history on the stage. And he doesn't claim that all people will behave the same all over the world in the same circumstances, which plays in rooms tend to. In other words, a Pinter play or a Beckett play presents an archetype. It presents a situation, oh, it could be like this in Shanghai. You could reset it in Rio. You can reset it somewhere else. Me, I don't think that's good. I think you need to have a sense of how these people became who they are, and that means you have to have a sense of the specific history. So in other words, created them. creating theatre for you is, is to do with an examination of change yeah. in the country. Because I don't think we're all the same everywhere. Beckett believes, you know, Beckett said this terrible thing where he said um, the quantity of suffering in the world is always the same. And I think if you believe that, I, I, don't know, I wouldn't know how to get up in the morning. <laughs> and uh, it just is so obviously not true. You know, what Ian was talking about earlier. There are things called advances. There are medical advances. There are legal advances. There are things that relieve suffering. There are things that make people suffer less. And they're worth writing about and arguing for, as Ian does. 
When um, you come to choose subjects, and let's take a specific example. Um, let's take Racing Demon, which is your play about the Church of England, uh, which was the first of a trilogy that you did later on under Richard Eyre's regime at the National about public life. The second one was Murmuring Judges about the law. The third one, The Absence of War, about the Labour Party and New Labour. Um, when you set out on the path to find out about the Church of England, did you have fixed views about it at first? Because you did research and so forth. Yeah, we had a terrible idea that we would create the Synod in uh, the Cottesloe. <laughs> <laughs> that I would go to the Synod and... <laughs> this is how bad an idea can be. Um, and that, you know, you'd all be sitting there and somebody would get up at the back and say, I'm the, you know, vicar of Bray and I wish to move a motion on behalf of, you know, Bray, that blah, blah. And that that was the idea. And it rapidly became apparent to me by actually talking to priests, vicars, I should say, um, that I didn't want to satirise them. And I think it was Richard's incredible perceptiveness that when I said Richard, to Richard, directed, Richard directed, Ayer yeah. was running the National Theatre yeah. and I said, I want to do a play about Vickers. And he said, that's great. And I said, I don't mean funny Vickers. And he said, no, that's, that's what's great. I know you won't do funny Vickers. And so, because they are in the theatre synonymous with <laughs> drop trousers and all that stuff. And so, you know, when I actually started talking to Vickers... Um, then I could see that they had replaced the social services in many ways in the inner city and that the work that they were doing was essentially social work. And they believed that they expressed the love of God through their own work and example, not through what they called pushing Christ down people's throats, which was a phrase I got very used to. You know, If I said, oh, you didn't mention God at all when you went round. They say, no, we don't push Christ down people's throats. <laughs> and I loved these people, and I admired them. And I thought that Thatcher had created a very divided society in which there were a lot of people who needed advice on how to get a subsidy for a stove. That was what they were dealing with. And for some reason, people trusted the vicar to fill in the form for them and go round to the social services department, where they'd been told to go away. And if they went with the vicar, suddenly, open sesame, they'd get their stove. And so that just seemed to me such a magnificent idea of what, Christian, of what Christianity was and could be. On the other hand, I could see it had a weak side to it, which is that conversion and faith came very, very low down the list. And there is something intrinsically comic in... in priests who can't talk about God. <laughs> Your plays are often about the weak and the strong. And in general, in terms of the drama, the strong win out. And they're often your most um, uh, energetic and colourful, in some ways entertaining characters. And I'm thinking of the Bishop of Southwark in yeah. Racing Demon who destroys, who destroys your vicar, really. Um, they often have a lot of energy, a lot of appetite for yeah. life, and a lot of ir irony, which is very attractive. Do you enjoy writing those characters? Well, I have a terrible weakness for it. Uh, <laughs> you know, we did, we did tell the nation, Howard Brenton and I told the nation nearly 30 years ago that Rupert Murdoch was not up to no good. This is a play that you did with Howard called we, Pravda. Yeah, when we wrote Pravda, and the world has finally caught up with us and realised that his newspapers are universally appalling. And he's now, it's the common wisdom to say that Rupert Murdoch is a terrible man, or we shall discover in the coming months. <laughs> he's or, you know, I shall stop there for legal reasons. <laughs> so... Uh, but, you know, it is now the common wisdom. When we wrote Pravda, it was not the common wisdom. So we spent an evening in, with Tony Hopkins playing an insane press magnate and uh, that was closely based on Rupert Murdoch. But was South African not? Yeah, South African, not Australian. A heavy layer of disguise. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day, in the audience, like at an event exactly like this, Joe Papp, who ran the... Um, New York Shakespeare Festival, got up and made this unbelievable speech, a, 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 a racist speech, I'm happy to say, in which he said, none of you English have got any energy. 
And he said, I spent the whole evening admiring Lambert LaRue, the South African, who at least in this desperate, flabby country, finally gets something done. You know, and he stood up and spoke this speech in, in praise of Lambert LaRue. And it was a sort of appeal by one mono maniac on behalf of another. And it was one of the best public speeches I've ever heard. I wish I'd had a tape recorder at the time. And there is a, there is a paradoxical energy. Nobody can deny that people like Rupert Murdoch have energy. Uh, but the moral direction of their energy is, you know, has been revealed in the last few years, even to the most ardent fan of energy, to be very, very morally doubtful indeed. And is it part of the fact that you create these characters as entertaining characters, part of a strategy, or is it just part of your... No, it's just, it's just um, joie de vivre. Because... <laughs> When you're called a political playwright, it, it's some journalists have often said that you are a better journalist than you are a dramatist, um, which I think is a misunderstanding in, in, in that what your plays do say to audiences goes deeper than most journalism. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I don't understand this at all because to me, I can't write a play. Um, the example that I always give that is the easiest to understand is when I wrote a play about the privatisation of the railway system, then obviously this was quite a tricky subject to write about, and I had absolutely no wish to write a documentary about the privatisation of the railway system. When I began to meet the survivors, and then to meet the bereaved, I realised that the people who were bereaved had a completely different attitude to these train accidents to the, than the survivors. The survivors are into hell, and now they wanted to move away and forget about it, whereas the bereaved could not find any peace until they understood absolutely everything about it. So you had two groups, one of whom were heading towards the event to discover more about it, and the other were moving rapidly away to try and forget it. And both had legitimate psychological needs for doing what they were doing. But these two groups were completely at odds, and they were, odds, they were at odds about everything. They were at odds about inquiries, they were at odds about memorials, they were at odds about events, they were at odds about criminal prosecutions, they were totally at odds. So you had two kinds of grief. And as soon as I could see that, a metaphor arrived. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine who had been in New York in the 1980s and was American, came out in floods of tears and said, I didn't realize you'd written a play about AIDS. And what he meant was he had lived through a period in the 80s when everybody was deeply invested in the question of what was avoidable and what was unavoidable suffering. And that is one of the most profound of all human questions. What do we have to suffer? And what, may, what, what suffering can we avoid? That, there is no bigger question. So I was writing a play about that subject, and my friend from New York at once saw that that was the subject I was writing about. But a journalist who comes to see that play is going to just go, oh, what does David Hare know about the train crashes that I don't know? Oh, what research has he done that's different from anybody else? Mm -hmm. But I'm writing it for the first person, not for the second. That's right. uh, another good example of that would be the absence of war, which um, you researched by... by being party to Neil Kinnock's campaign uh, when he lost. Um, but in actual fact, that play goes into something much deeper about the socialist movement. Yeah, yes. it, 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 it's, it, you know, I, I, it's my own fault. In other words, if I, a year or a year, two years after an election, create a play with a working class leader who, like, who resembles Neil Kinnock in many ways, then it was an incredible foolishness on my part to imagine that I could expect newspapers to understand that. There's, there's no way a newspaper journalist is going to understand that as anything but a, a pièce à clé, a coded uh, piece about Neil Kinnock. And so that, the larger things that I was writing about, it was too close, it was only two years later, Neil's failure or whatever you call it in public, his humiliation in public really, because as Neil Kinnock said, it is a very heavy load to bear to know that 
the sole reason you have lost an election is because the electorate does not like you and that it's personal. And he had to bear that from 26 million people. And I think the dignity with which he bore it was incredible. I have unbelievable respect for the way he conducted himself when he knew that the election was winnable and the only reason it wasn't won was specifically because of him. And the courage he showed in those circumstances seemed to me extraordinary. But having said that, I was writing about something larger, which was that the socialist dream could no longer be articulated. And in the last uh, however many years, really since the counter-revolution in 1979, I haven't heard the socialist dream articulated successfully, convincingly, in public. Um, there may be exceptions, and people may speak to this who can cite people who are able to do this. Um, but we all sense this immense frustration on the left that uh, wh why can't they speak? Why can't they say it anymore? There's a, a very powerful moment in the absence of war where your character, George, is told, now speak out, tell the public what, 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 what you really... And he can't speak. He He's no longer silent, can speak. Which That's... is a very dramatic moment, yeah. not a journalistic one. But it's my fault in the sense that when the play was um, revived ten years later... Yeah. Then, of course, the critics then write, oh, this is his masterpiece. But, I, you know, they can't see it at the time because they can't get past the journalistic element. And what about the audience, David, at those plays? Did you feel that it was getting through to them as opposed to, as opposed to the journalists and critics? Oh, yeah. I've, I've always had, um, you know, by and large, my plays have been made by the public. And so I've constantly written plays that the um, press advised the public not to attend. <laughs> and <laughs> in defiance of the press, the public have attended. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you also are a great collaborator in that you've directed a lot of your work. Um, you've also collaborated particularly with Howard Brenton. Um, it's not just about your own work. Is that, is that a deliberate thing that you do? It's more a sort of trick of character. Um, you know, the fact is, and I don't, think, I don't expect anybody to understand this, and believe me, I'm not asking for pity from anybody, but the fact is it is a very corrosive business detaining 700 people in the evening and saying, I'm more worth listening to than you enjoying yourself by going out and having supper. So that playwriting is a very bruising business. And when I first went into it, and this is not a bid for sympathy, I promise, but when I first went into it, I noticed that all the seasoned playwrights that I met were extremely difficult people. And I would not recommend to anybody a relaxed social evening with... <laughs> John Osborne, Harold Pinter, you know, <laughs> make, make, make the list yourself, right? T touchy doesn't begin to say, right? And, you know, you begin to start saying, oh, there's a group characteristic here. You know, I, I knew Tennessee Williams very well. Tennessee had one theme to his conversation, which was the decline of his reputation. He would be absolutely astonished now to find how high his reputation mm -hmm. stands. Tennessee, an evening with Tennessee, consisted of many hours of Tennessee telling you how impossible as, it was for him. As to a monologue, it. was it? Or? Yeah. <laughs> you could occasionally say, but I think you're great, Tennessee. <laughs> but that was sort of all you could get in. But, and the bastards in New York won't put my plays on, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And, and it is corrosive. I, you know, I can only tell you, it is corrosive because you um, are up there on your own and you're making this claim on people's attention and time and it makes you phenomenally oversensitive and so there is it, it, you know it, 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 it has an effect on your character and so I've always felt more cheerful in company I like going into battle with my friends <laughs> and I like having people alongside me um, who are going to carry the load with me uh, because I, it's not good for you playwriting it's not good for your character do you think that's why a, a, a lot of playwrights only write a few plays? Yeah. And then, which is, what was it, 29 plays you've written? Yes. Most of them hits. Yes. Still no, going. It's a, gl <laughs> a glutton for punishment. I, I think people do find the way of life incredibly hard. And I, it doesn't look it from the outside. 
Uh, but, you know, I am conscious, if I'm sitting among you, I am conscious of every moment of inattention. I'm conscious of every cough. Yeah. I'm conscious of, you know, every time a scene that I thought was blindingly clear is opaque. Every time, you know, it is a public art form in that way. And th that you are tested in a way that a novelist is never tested. Uh, you know, novelists get very excited if they see one person on the train reading their book. And they say to you, oh, I saw somebody reading my book today. And I say, really? I was with 600 people watching my play last and, night. And you know. by and large, novelists are judged by other novelists yeah. in the reviews. Yeah. Is, what do you say? Yeah, they're judged by fellow artists. And, you know, it's, it's a peer group thing, isn't it? Yeah. And that's, a, that's not something we're judged by you. And that is not comfortable. And just to turn to you, your filmmaking at the moment, because I think that's an, a, a, another way in which you've, you've, you've had quite, a, 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 people don't this, know this as much, quite a, an effect on the culture. Um, the first film you ever did was a television film called Licking Hitler. I remember you came with a very, very specific view of how to direct that piece, and it had to be you. Is that true? Yes. Which was not in the manner in which those plays for the day were made. Uh, which were generally, if they were on film, they were all location, was Ken Loach, in pubs, on the streets, in real places. I, I, I have this theory that anybody can make a first film. And that, um, you know, film directors really do burn out very, very quickly. And most film directors' careers are U-shaped. In other words, they start at the top and then they go down. And then they crawl along the bottom for a while. And then in many years' time, they may climb back up. And the great ones do climb back up. But the first one you make because you've been going to the cinema for the last 25 years and you're longing to make one yourself so you yeah. know how to do it. And you can throw yourself at an art form like that and you always make a big impression with the first one. Um, but then you've got to learn how to do it. And Stephen Frears, more often than was necessary, kept saying to me, your first film is a fluke. You don't really know anything about filmmaking and on your, and on your second you'll find out. He said, with great pleasure, rubbing his hands. And he turned out to be entirely correct. <laughs> but just recently, you, you have gone back to um, film on t in television. Yeah, I finally worked out how to make films, yeah. <laughs> but it's a bit late in life. <laughs> <laughs> and the next play that you've got lined off, we'll move on to questions after this. Tell us about that. Uh, that's the adaptation of a book by Catherine Boo called Behind the Beautiful Forevers. Um, Catherine Boo went to live, uh, well, she lived beside a slum in Mumbai at the end of the runway in Mumbai Airport. And I really have for a long time been looking for a way of writing about the, most, the poorest and most powerless. And uh, Catherine Boo's book is a record of what happened in those three years and really a kind of um, examination of how the poor really do live. And it's set among garbage sorters. And uh, it is the opportunity for the National Theatre, finally, after so many years, to have an all-Asian company in yeah. the Olivier, which it has never, to its shame, had. Um, and so, yeah, we're in the middle of trying to create... So it will be an all-Asian cast? An all-Asian cast, and it's, we're in the middle of trying to work out how to create Mumbai uh, in the Olivier. And to be directed by the National's new... Rufus uh, Norris yes. is directing it, yeah. <laughs> so you... Rufus is... Ca Rufus is it's, <laughs> he, he's taking on Mumbai. That's very good. You did write... I mean, it, for anyone who hasn't read the book, I don't know if... Kate hasn't been here, I don't think. But has she been here? Uh, yeah. Well, it's a lapse it's of taste time. for which I shall correct her. You, um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I think that it's just uh, for those of you who love nonfiction, it's an incredible work of nonfiction, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a work of incredible integrity and vision, really, about what do we do about these places. You. Actually, one of your other plays has been set in Mumbai, which is yeah. A Map of the World, yeah. which dealt with a conference attended by uh, a living, famous Indian novelist who settled in Britain, not a million miles away from <laughs> Mr. Paul, I think. But I just, before asking questions, at one point, he's a very 
mischievous, challenging, non-politically correct writer who delights in upsetting liberals and radicals. Um, and he's asked at one point in the play, um, um, by, I can't remember, but it says, he asks him, when you start out, how do you write a book? This is, the novelist is asked. Meta, he's called. I mean, when you start out, do you know what you think? A meta replies, no. The act of writing is the act of discovering what you believe. That sounds as though it's... <laughs> it's me. Yes. Yeah, it is me. Uh, when I started writing Racing Demon, then I realized that I was writing as if I thought it were a terrible thing. I couldn't work out what was wrong with my lament for the Church of England. And when I got to the end of the first act, I kind of went, why doesn't this convince me for a moment? And I suddenly thought, oh, I know why it doesn't convince me. I don't believe in God. So am I really sad that the Church of England is on the skids? Does this really upset me? In other words, this then confirms what I think, which is the first character in a play that you have to get right is yourself. You have to work out what your own attitude to the material is. And I realized my attitude was a lot more complicated, that although I admired the vicars, I didn't agree with them. And so because I don't agree with them, the play became much more interesting and much, much richer and much more conflicted and much more humane, actually, for the fact that it wasn't just the knee-jerk, nobody's going to church and isn't this tragic kind of play. Yeah. Um, and so working out what y you often go in not knowing what you believe. And then in the process of writing something, you discover what you believe. And you discover it much more profoundly than you could if you were a guest on Question Time or having a dinner party at which you argued things through with friends. You, 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 every single moment is inflected in a play by what it is that the author does or doesn't believe. Okay, and on that point, I think we, we, it'd be nice to open it out. To, to see what your discoveries might be about David's work or questions. So. Oh, we've got, we've got one. Okay. If you've got any, any memories of actually seeing David's plays, responding to them negatively or not, that might be interesting later. Okay. Well, that, <laughs> not now. <laughs> well, the, the first thing I wanted to say was, was thank you very much for wonderful hours in the theatre over many, many years. I've seen all your plays. I've loved every second of them. Um, oh, I yeah. particularly like the State of the Nation plays, and I wondered if maybe at the back of your mind you could see the dramatic potential perhaps in the coalition government? <laughs> it, that's what I mean. It's very hard to explain that I am as prone to... I, I, I'm, I'm as vulnerable to my imagination as any other writer. People think that political writers are what I call short-order cooks, meaning if you can cook a hamburger, you can cook a lobster, you know. I can't. In other words, when I wrote a play about the Chinese Revolution, I can't explain to you why the Chinese Revolution fires my dramatic imagination. And someone immediately said to me, oh, can, you, can we now have one on the Russian Revolution? No, I can't write about the Russian Revolution. I can't face all those characters with those names addressing each other. <laughs> it just sort of seems dead to me. I, I just don't want to see that play myself because I can't think of a way to do it. When I went to Israel-Palestine for Via Dolorosa, then literally somebody then rang me and said, this is absolutely fantastic. Can you come and do Northern Ireland now? <laughs> and it's, it's very hard to explain that just as Lucien Freud or Francis Bacon couldn't tell you why they paint what they paint, I can't really tell you why I can write about one subject but I can't write about another. It's completely mysterious. But I can tell you that David Cameron does not fire my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh my God, Beth. Oh, Beth's good. Oh, someone else. Someone else. Someone else. But you've done a number of adaptations as well, and that's a different position as a writer. Is it something about somebody else's work that fires your imagination, or? Well, I've adapted um, uh, Josephine Hart's novel. Uh, damage, and then I did uh, um, Michael Cunningham's book, The Hours, and Bernard Schlink, The Reader. Um, and in every case, I was dealing with incredibly enlightened original writers, 
and they were writers who accepted that the cinema works by different rules to uh, the novel. Um, and so in each case, and particularly Michael, and it's interesting because Michael is coming here, and uh, Michael just took the attitude, which was Virginia Woolf did one thing with this material, I did a second thing with this material, and now you, David, may do a third thing with this material. And he saw us simply as handing the baton on, but then he's a very, very enlightened man. The thing that has changed decisively is that modern writers do not condescend to the cinema. In other words, that, those days in which novelists used to say, oh, I'm selling, my, you know, I'm selling my novel to the cinema. Hollywood will mess it up, but I'll get 50,000 pounds. You know, they'll go away and make rubbish. You know, the, what one might call the Levisite attitude yeah. to cinema is now transformed. People like Michael, Bernard Schlink, regard the cinema as, as complex, detailed, you know, important an art form as the novel. There's no sense of slumming it when they sell their books. And so it's wonderful. You go into a collaboration with somebody who really wants the film to be as good as possible and to represent their, um, you know, their work to the best. Is that the same with Josephine Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's no secret, God knows there's enough journalism on the subject that absolutely nobody on Damage got on at all. Uh, or rather, you know, it was a very contentious shoot. Um, and the only person, and I was incredibly struck by this at Josephine's funeral, um, that the only person who remained friends with all of us was Josephine. And we were all falling out like cats, I mean, fighting in a bag. And uh, it was a very, very difficult film to make. And... Uh, at, Josephine was just exemplary in terms of just being, trying to be conciliatory between really deeply warring parties on that movie. There was a corollary to the film in terms of trying with the, the book. Mm -hmm. Is there something? Because there... You, you're going to need it. Just shining with the, the material of the book that you adapt, sorry. No, it's more that the minute I read the book... I know if I can do it or not. Um, it's, I can't work to see if I can do something. I read it. The hours scared me because people kept saying to me, oh, you're adapting that impossible book. And I kept going, I don't think it's impossible at all, right? To which they all kept saying, but it's all interior monologue. And I kept saying, yeah, that's what's so great about it. I'm going to invent scenes that express what he expresses through interior monologue. That's why I'm excited by it. Um, and so many people said it to me, I started going, am I very thick? I, have I taken on this ridiculously impossible job without realizing it? Um, it was much more difficult doing the reader simply because Bernard Schlink refuses to be completely clear about whether the events happened to him or not. <laughs> so that's, that made it a bit trickier. Yeah, it's tricky, yeah. Hi, it's uh, just quite a brief question about the Warwicker trilogy that you did recently. I wanted to ask what, what stimulated that, what spurred that regarding the timing? Since while I enjoyed it a great deal, watching these quite recently, it felt a little bit like this was perhaps retelling something that in some ways we all knew. Ray Fiennes as Blair effectively. This is a story we knew from a previous political era somehow. So why, why do it now? I don't think it is from a previous political area. In other words, the blackmail that we're continuing a war on terror and that in the interests of that war on terror, which what, has been going on now for, what, 2001 to 2014? It's a 13-year war we've been in now. Um, and on the grounds of that 13-year war, we're allowed to have our liberties encroached upon in the way we are, and we're colluding with people who are, uh, you know, indulging in practices which are illegal in this country and which for, it is illegal for us to be colluding in. What do you want me to do? Stop talking about it? I, I, I can't stop talking about it. And it also seems to me that what I was saying about the role of politics, which is that, you know, the politicians have delegated um, their policy, for they've delegated foreign policy to Washington, they've delegated um, domestic policy to the intelligence services, no wonder we despise them. If they give away all their own area of control, you know, what are they for? And so it, it seems to me a blazingly contemporary subject. But if I fail to communicate that, that's sad. But I, it seems to me bang up to date.
Uh, I thought it was extraordinarily relevant, bang up to date, and actually quite uncomfortable viewing because it felt like barely disguised fact. Um, I would like to know, did you have any trouble? Um, because it seemed to me so real. Uh, and is there any connection between the barely disguised fact and the fact that the establishment seemed to want to withdraw the licence fee from the BBC? <laughs> It, it, you mean, do, do, do my films endanger the licence fee? Is that what? <laughs> I don't think so. Did anybody give you hmm? any trouble? Did anybody give you any trouble? None whatsoever, no. Well, okay. uh, I mean, you know, uh, none whatsoever. I mean, what I'm arguing anyway, to be fair, is that the arguments that we are having outside the intelligence services are also going on inside the intelligence services. And I think it's terribly important to understand this. You know, the intelligence services are not monolithic. It's not a point of view. There's 5,000, 6,000 people working in MI5. Uh, more now, probably. Um, and so within that, just as in the Church of England, or just as in the Labour Party, or just as in the Tory Party, yeah. there are wings. There are people who believe one thing, and there are people... The argument about complicity with the Americans in what the Americans are doing is an argument that was live inside MI5. So, in, you know, I... I you know, that... They're arguing as we're arguing. It's, it's, and so, in fact, they are slightly bewildered by why the argument is not more passionate yeah. outside. I, I'd just say, as an ex-BBC person, that, in fact, there's been a relative absence of this kind of drama on television, intelligent politics also entertaining. And in, in an odd way, that's likely to boost the bid for a licence fee, because audiences do come to it gratefully, rather than, you know, the other th side. I, I don't find the pressures of censorship at the BBC nearly as intense as they were in the 80s. And so at the end of the 70s and 80s, you could barely get anything. I mean, Ian McEwan, you know, his whole television film was banned. Uh, you know, uh, there, were, there was a banning a week in those days. Now, you may say that was a sign that there was more contentious material on television, that there was more banning. But if you come along with something uh, that you really wanted to do, as I did, I, I had nothing but help and support from everybody at the BBC. They were wonderful. Sorry. That's all right. Hello. Oh. Sorry. Um, thank you very much for so many wonderful plays. But the thing that stuck in my mind for years was Via Dolorosa at the Almeida and seeing you perform that. And I just wondered whether you, well, whether it ever gets performed now, because obviously you're not doing it, um, and have you any more plans for something like that? Or was that the beginning and end of your days as an actor? It's <laughs> uh, a play that David, it was a one-man show, and David said, no, you're an actor, I've got to do this myself, about Israel and Palestine. That was my acting career. You were present. <laughs> you were present for the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's over. Uh, it ended. What can I say? It, it, this was a classic instance of an idea had to have a particular shape. I went to Israel-Palestine. I went, bloody hell. This is nothing like everybody has told me it's like. And I just, again, had an artistic problem that if I came back and we got some North London Jewish actors and then, oh, we got a few Arab actors and a Pakistani and they all stood with those awful machine guns <laughs> at unconvincing checkpoints and aggressed each other. Oh, it's not drama, is it? And so I wanted to come back and just speak about what I'd seen and try and incite the audience to the same state of incredible stimulation that I was in from going to the region for the first time. And so, you know, you can only do that once. You can only do it once. You can't come back and say, oh, by the way, Rio's very interesting too. <laughs> <laughs> I, d I did get offered some film parts after, uh, yeah, I off offered acting parts, and I was always then very interested to see who took my parts <laughs> when, I, when, I, when, I, when I turned them down. It was not always very flattering. <laughs> Can I, can I ask you a question about the most recent play of yours that I've seen, which, of course, is not a recent play. That's Judas Kiss, uh, about Oscar Wilde. It seemed the first time round it wasn't a success. This time round it was tremendous, had huge, huge support from critics and audience alike. Would you like to tell us a little bit about 
how it feels to risk something again, having been not particularly popular the first time, and then being profoundly successful the second time. Golly, um, that's such a difficult question, that. Um, I suppose I always believed it was one of my best plays. And so it, it, it's very rare for me. I tend, uh, perhaps having been brought up in the way I was brought up, always tend to credit my enemies. I tend to think they're right. And so when I don't think they're right, um, it's really exceptional for me. And with The Judas Kiss, I never thought they saw the play. Uh, for the reason, mainly, that the production... We, we were pushing the envelope with the play anyway, in the sense that it was a complete reconception of how Wilde should be seen. But casting Ireland's most famous heterosexual, Liam Neeson, in the original production was probably pushing the envelope a little too far, <laughs> we would now say. And not that Liam wasn't great, but nevertheless, there is a problem, Liam Neeson, Oscar Wilde. And so it... It, 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 you know, we were pushing our luck, and our luck failed us, really, first time round. Uh, but if you say to me, what is it like, ten years later, uh, to have a play revived, and this time they all say it's as good as you believe it to be, you have a feeling primarily of relief that you are not insane. Um, <laughs> that's what I felt. I just felt, oh my God, I am not insane. I, I, and, and it's one of the happiest things in my life ever, as a writer, to feel that now people can see what I was on about. And with Rupert Everett playing the part, they, they could see what I was on about. Um, I'm interested in uh, two things, two decisions that you seem to have taken. Um, one is why you decided to go for verbatim theatre over the Iraq war play and the rail privatisation, as opposed to adopting a slightly more distance, more imaginative approach. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't think they worked quite as well as perhaps some of your other plays, which I've really enjoyed. The second one is right from the start of your career, you seemed to go out to write big parts for women, which at the time was unusual. I mean, I think of Licking Hitler and Plenty for Kate Nelligan and so on. Was that a conscious decision? Um, because it seemed to me to make a big statement at the time. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, I, I found myself writing for women, and uh, it just was partly because I'd been brought up by women, my mother and my sister. My father was absent throughout my childhood because he was a sailor. And so, you know, women were my m m milieu. They were the world I lived in. And so when I came to write, they were the people I wanted to write about. And uh, it happened that at the same time, they were very unrepresented on the British stage. And so, you know, I had this glorious... I've been super served, if you like, by actresses, simply because um, actresses don't have much... They don't, they're not spoilt like actors for choice. And so I've had a succession of unbelievable actresses in my work because of the fact that I do prefer to write about women. And so it's just a temperamental... Preference. The question about verbatim, um, yeah. Um, I did make up two thirds of stuff happens because two thirds of what happened between Bush and Blair and the diplomatic process was behind closed doors. So I said, whenever I write a scene, it's made up. But I did also use direct dress. Yeah, I'm sick to death of verbatim too, <laughs> is the answer to that. You said that 30 years ago, uh, you identified, you fingered Rupert Murdoch uh, to become the person that we now uh, recognize him as being. I wondered, uh, for 30 years from today, who would you finger today as an up and <laughs> as, as an up and coming up and coming demon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know perfectly well we had to do a, we had to put a thin layer of disguise on our uh, criticisms of Rupert Murdoch in order to avoid. We, we had a wonderful meeting with a lawyer um, in which um, the lawyer read Pravda and the lawyer was very English stuff, you know, judicious guy. And he said, um, well, as far as I can see, this play is a portrait of a man who cannot get any sexual satisfaction except from the pleasure of firing people. He's psychopathic, he's socially maladjusted and he loves screaming and he said, if Rupert Murdoch really wishes to step forward and identify himself. <laughs> Is that 
we are. We and who says the law has no sense of humour? <laughs> okay, well then on that blissful... Oh, <laughs> that everyone? Well, on, on that blissful note, um, I'd like to thank David um, and Peter for an immensely rich, revealing, profound and entertaining session. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>